Today's presentation, Agile Project Management for PMPs uh, by Michelle Sliger, is specifically aimed at traditionally trained software project managers who are new to Agile and who would like to be able to relate the Project Management Institute's best practices to their equivalent practices in Agile. Michelle is the co-author of the Software Project Manager's Bridge to Agility and has extensive experience in the Agile software development space and is a self-described bridge builder. Her passion lies in helping those in traditional software development environments cross the bridge to agility. Michelle is the owner of Flyer Consulting, where she consults with businesses ranging from small startups to Fortune 500 companies. She is a certified project management professional and certified Scrum trainer. You can visit her website at flyerconsulting.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you. Um, so this is, well, the title here says that we're going to talk about mapping from the PMBOK Guide to Agile Practices. I do want to make one thing clear, which is that um, you'll, you'll note in uh, the first few slides that I'm going to talk also a lot about Agile values, because even though um, a lot of folks seem to think it's as simple as setting down your traditional or waterfall types of practices and simply then picking up agile practices and doing those instead and then the you know the miracle occurs and poof you're agile that's not really the way it goes um, while there is a, a, a set of corresponding practices that you can do uh, as part of embracing agile it's not just about swapping practices. It's about really understanding the cultural change that's going to happen, and it's about understanding um, the, the shift from being plan-driven to being value-driven. So uh, we've already gone through my introduction, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, skip this slide and, and talk about what we'll cover. Um, I have a brief overview of Agile for those of you who are uh, new to the whole concept. And then we'll look at the acceptance of Agile by the Project Management Institute. Um, again, it's just part of encouraging uh, folks who are PMPs, if you are worried, can I, I maintain my uh, project uh, management professional certification, uh, follow the ideas outlined in the PMBOK and still be Agile, the answer is yes. And if that's what you were looking for, you're all set, you've got your answer. And and you should be good to go. And then for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about you know, the traditional versus Agile, and, and then the mapping uh, to Agile practices. We'll start with integration, uh, go to scope, and then go to quality. Obviously, we won't have time to cover all of the knowledge areas that are outlined in the PMBOK. Um, and we also have um, uh, risk as an additional area, and we'll have to see if we have time to fit that in. Then we'll look at how your role will change and then where you can find some more information. So we're going to start off with the Agile Manifesto. Um, many of you have probably already seen this. Um, in addition to the Manifesto, I want to encourage you also to look at uh, the website for the associated principles that um, are part of the Manifesto. These are the guiding principles that all Agile approaches adhere to. Um, and a lot of folks will read the manifesto and stop there. And I want to encourage you to keep reading. I think there's only 13 principles. So it, it's a quick read. Um, but reading them and understanding them uh, really helps you to understand what Agile really is all about. So this manifesto is um, really stating what the individuals who were at that time doing what was called lightweight software development um, came to an agreement on in, I believe it was 2001 in Utah when they all met together. And they agreed um, that they were uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it themselves and by helping others to do it. And, and through this work, they came to value uh, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following the plan. And this, this is an important piece here as well. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So a lot of folks um, being new to Agile will assume that once they look at this manifesto, may, they may not read it all the way through. They may replace the word over with the word instead, you know, with uh, our, our um, 
sometimes we read what we want to read instead of what's really there. And what they'll read instead is, oh, well, we don't do documentation anymore. And, and that's a fallacy. That, that's simply not true. We'll do documentation, and we'll do the appropriate documentation, you know, given the, the constraints that we have to work with. So I don't want you to think that if you adopt Agile practices that you won't be doing documentation anymore. And, and the other fallacy that I hear a lot is that, oh, we're Agile, so we don't plan anymore. And that's also uh, completely untrue. In fact, um, one of the things that I discovered when I made the transition was that once um, I started down the Agile path, I, I discovered we planned all the time. It, it's not just, you know, you plan once at the beginning of the project and then try to re-baseline every so often. It, we plan in Agile um, at the beginning of each release, at the beginning of each time box iteration that we're working in, which is between, say, one to four weeks. And even at the beginning of every day, we'll have a plan for what we're going to do that day. So we're constantly planning and constantly revisiting um, whether or not our, our plan is still appropriate. So this was the graphic that helped me when I made the shift from uh, waterfall approaches to Agile, was really seeing how we flip this triangle. We start off in waterfall with fixing all of our requirements, and that leads us to be very plan-driven. Um, because what we've done is we've estimated the amount of resources both people and money take to implement all of these requirements given the estimate of the time that we've created by putting things into uh, a tool that allows to do resource loading and resource leveling. And so we become very plan-driven so as not to change um, the, this amazing plan that we've created. But the truth is, is that change always happens. And Agile is about embracing that change. So what we've done instead with Agile is we've embraced the fact that there is change and that there is uncertainty. So why don't we go ahead and fix things that we believe we can fix and that often are fixed for us anyway, like time. We usually have a deadline that we're trying to reach. And we're also often, at least when, when I was a project manager working for others, I was often told that I had to have all of these things done um, in terms of features, and I had to have them all done by this time, and I had to make do with the budget and the team that I had in place. So they tried to fix all three, which of course never works. But instead, I just says, well, let's fix the deadline, let's fix the time, and let's go with the idea that we have fixed resources as well. And given that, now what we're going to estimate are the features. So that means that we have to become value-driven, because if we are not going to get all of the features in, in the time that we have, and we accept that as a given, then what we need to do is focus on delivering the features that provide the most business value first. That's the key. We have to provide the features first that are going to um, assist those who have contracted with us um, to create um, solutions for the business problems that they have. So the sooner that we can do that, the better, and therefore we need to make sure that our features um, are in order by the most important to the least important, so that we're providing the most important ones first to our customers. Now, there are a lot of Agile frameworks. If you think of Agile as being like an umbrella here, that underneath it has several different iterative and incremental approaches that adhere to the Agile manifesto and its guiding principles. Um, then sometimes that, that helps people understand that, that all of these approaches are Agile approaches. Scrum is uh, often referred to as a, an Agile project management framework um, created by Kim Schwaber, uh, Mike Beadle, and Jeff Sutherland, um, and X XP, or Extreme Programming, uh, created by uh, Kent Beck, who authored a, an amazing book called Embrace Change. Um, these two tend to be you know, the most popular ones, but what we're also seeing in the industry now is lean, 
Um, and Mary and Tom Poppendick have written uh, a couple of books on lean software development that are really fantastic. And we're also seeing uh, Kanban, which I always thought of as a lean tool, but it seems to be almost emerging as its own separate um, approach to developing software. So you're going to hear a lot about Scrum, XP, Lean, and Kanban in the future. And if you look at a generic Agile process here, we'll, we'll start with that product backlog, and it will be ranked in order of importance the items in them, uh, whether they be features or bugs or, or whatever they happen to be. There's simply work to be done. And this work is um, uh, parsed out into time boxes. So while this is all of the features that we want for the product, we'll put a, a cut line in here to let us know that for the first release, we're just looking for this set of features. And then we'll take these features and we'll break them into smaller pieces that can then be worked in iterations. And a group of iterations will make up a release. And at the end of the release, you can push to production, you can push to a beta, you can simply work to integrate it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a release to production. And on the flip side of that, you could release to production uh, in each iteration as often as you like. So it really depends on the team's ability to deliver as well as your customer or product owner's uh, decision with regard to whether or not they feel that it's feature rich enough to push to production. And then, of course, after a release, you're still going to have a product backlog. That, that often doesn't go away until the project officially ends or you, you run out of money. Now, with PMBOK, they have project phases. And so they start with initial, have a group of intermediate phases, and then end with a final phase. And Agile does this as well. In fact, we refer to this as the Agile fractal, the idea that in, in uh, Agile, we also have initial phases at the beginning, uh, final phases at the end, and intermediate phases throughout. For example, in a release, you'll have release planning at the beginning, a group of iterations that make up that release, and then a review at the end, where we'll have a retrospective um, to examine how we can continue to improve. And then if we take that down to the iteration level, where we work in time boxes um, of one to four weeks, then at the beginning of each iteration, we'll have a planning session. Then we'll work each of the features, stories, requirements, whatever you choose to call them, through to completion. And then at the end of that iteration, we'll have a demo of the working code and a retrospective to, to take a look at how we did and ways that we can improve and things we want to change going forward. So PMI's view of Agile is that there's, there's no, well, first of all, if we take this from, um, I've got the third edition of the PMBOK here. I, I haven't read the fourth edition. Um, I've heard that it's thicker than the third edition. And, and ever after having just read the third edition, I can't seem to find, uh, find it in me to pick up the fourth edition and sit down and read it. So I am a little bit behind. But in the third edition, there are a couple of quotes that make it clear that there's you know, nothing wrong with using Agile. In fact, they say that there's no single best way to define an ideal project life cycle. And they go on to say that the project manager, in collaboration with the project team, is always responsible for determining what processes are appropriate and the appropriate degree of rigor for each process for any given project. So uh, again, um, the PMBOK, even though folks, some folks seem to believe that um, in order to be following the, uh, the ideas set forth in it, that you have to use a waterfall approach, it doesn't say that anywhere in it that thou shalt do waterfall. Uh, and it's very clear that you get to determine what processes are appropriate and the appropriate degree of rigor for each. So um, your documentation may be simply a picture you took of the whiteboard, if that's an appropriate degree of rigor for what you're doing. Or it could be something more detailed, particularly if you have to pass audits like the Sarbanes-Oxley audit or an FDA audit. 
There's also now a PMI Agile Forum. Um, there used to be, and there still are, special interest groups, or SIGs. And now the, the PMI has changed these, and they're being called virtual community programs. So uh, a group of us, here you'll see the steering committee down here, uh, got together and said, what we need to do is create a PMI Agile Forum. And we've been working with PMI, and we are now in the midst of a soft launch. So we hope to be formalized um, by the fourth quarter of this year, if not sooner. And in the meantime, if you would like to take a look at what we've been up to, you can come and visit us on uh, our discussion board here. Or if you'd like to take a look at the wiki that we're preparing and help contribute, then you can click on this link. And that will take you to the wiki that we're uh, filling up with links to um, Agile resources. For example, um, I probably should have put, uh, in fact, I think I did put this webinar out there on the PMI um, Agile wiki. Well, the soft launch is also um, going to include um, uh, a SharePoint page that is sponsored by PMI. Right now, uh, only a select few have access to it as we work out the kinks. Once we're through our soft launch and we get feedback on that, then I'll have another link for you here that will be to the uh, PMI pages and the SharePoint pages that are going to be sponsoring us. So looking at traditional versus agile project management, there's a couple of key differences here. Um, in traditional, we plan what we expect to happen. And we do that in agile as well. But we do it with detail that's appropriate to the horizon. And we'll look at that in, in the next few slides. But essentially, what we're saying is the less we know, then the grosser the level of detail. And when we're getting ready to actually do the work in each iteration, that's when we're going to detail the tasks out and look at the hours that it will take us to do the tasks and um, follow through appropriately with that level of detail then. So we're going to, um, uh, in the old way, we would enforce that what happens is the same as what was planned um, using a variety of uh, command and control types of approaches. But in Agile, we say that control is through inspection and adaptation. And we have self-organizing teams the ones that are doing the work are the ones in the best position to, to recognize what needs to change in order to achieve the goals that have been outlined for them and that they've committed to. And we'll do this as a result of reviews and retrospectives. In the old way, we would use change control to manage change. Uh, we'd have a change control board. We'd have separate defect management. Um, but with Agile, we have prioritized backlogs that contain all of the work that we need to do, not just the features, but the bugs as well. And we give control of that backlog to the business owner, whether that happens to be the end user, the customer, the product owner. It, it's the one individual who has the, uh, the authority to make decisions about the product and who is speaking with the voice of the customer understanding what their business needs are and what the business problems are. So they're ranking that backlog in order of importance. And that becomes how we handle change control. So now let's take a look at PMBOK to Agile practices. Um, first, we want to look at uh, integration management. And, and a key deliverable in integration management is the project plan document. Uh, that's prepared and owned by the project manager. Um, and in Agile software development, with its emphasis on just-in-time design and participatory decision-making uh, by the team, this activity translates into several different um, envisioning and planning exercises that are done uh, on an iterative basis. So rather than defining all of the elements uh, of a project plan at the beginning of the project, like um, scope, the work breakdown structure, the schedule, the assumptions, and, and all of the controls. The Agile project manager instead focuses on planning using a level of detail that's more appropriate and realistic for the time horizon. 
Um, so this planning is done during um, release and iteration planning meetings in Agile that involve the entire team. And uh, so projects, uh, project managers often go from writing these large detailed documents defining the plan for the entire project to facilitating the team in, in their ongoing iterative planning efforts and sharing that information in the most visible way possible. Um, it, so the other thing that we'll do is we have a focus on collaborative teams. And as a, as a result of having teams that are self-organizing uh, do participatory decision making through their collaborative efforts, the project manager now needs to focus uh, less on trying to control things and more on facilitating this process that the team is going through to reach consensus on decisions that they're making on how to deliver according to the goals that they've committed to. They serve the team in making sure that all obstacles are removed so that the team can do their best work. And they lead the team by reminding them of the vision, of their commitments, of their decisions that they've made, um, and helping to instantiate the Agile process within the team, as well as its values. And finally, we've got um, the change control process, which I mentioned earlier is, is really um, uh, via the ranked backlog of features. Um, so we'll take a look at what all of this now looks like. So we want to start with that ranked product backlog. And, and you can use 3 by 5 cards, which is what a lot of co-located XP teams like to use. Of course, if you're not co-located, then you're going to need to use some kind of tool. Here's a, a screenshot of version 1. And down here at the bottom, this is where we have our backlog listed. So it provides um, some opportunities for folks to drill down into this, sort, uh, filter, and do, do whatever you need to do to really get a feel for what's in the product backlog, as well as when these items are going to be worked coming up in, in future iterations. Again, if you're co-located, you can use Post-its or 3 by 5 cards and create um, your iteration plan uh, by working together and just working at a whiteboard. And here you can see our iteration plan was created um, from this overarching release plan. We have two releases here at the top. The first release has three iterations in it. It's got, looks like, three uh, features or stories per iteration. They're on iteration number two. And they've now gone to a level of detail since they're beginning to do the iteration planning that allows them to break this out, this, this story or feature out into tasks. And they're able to do this with each one. And unfortunately, what this team discovered, once they began to break out this third one and look at the number of hours that they, they had available and the number of hours that uh, their breakout said that they needed, they ended up taking this final and putting it right back into the backlog to be worked either in this next iteration or perhaps um, divided up and worked later on, depending on what the product owner wanted. And this one just didn't make the cut because we just weren't able to commit to it. Here's another example of uh, what your iteration plan might look like. Um, again, we this is a, a task board that, that shows what we've created in, in terms of this is what we've committed to doing. And moving it across this task board over here into the Done column. And you can create whatever uh, column headings you want, whether your, your tests are ready here, your, your work is in progress, it's, it's waiting to be verified. And then finally, your work moves over here to Done. So this is how we do control in our uh, integration management, this idea of making things highly visible so we can see at a glance where things are and how well we're doing with regard to being able to meet our commitment for that iteration. And of course, if you're not co-located, again, you're going to need a tool. This is a virtual task board that allows us to do this uh, monitoring of the progress 
um, and um, by creating uh, a, a virtual task board. And again, these column headings are, are customizable, and, and you can set things up the way that's most appropriate for your team. So let's look at scope management now. Um, we've got our scope definition, again, that we define and redefine constantly in each planning meeting because we have our change control being the ranked backlog. And that backlog can change between iterations. Once the team commits to an iteration, then you're locked in. So that at the end of the planning meeting, the team will say, OK, we believe that we can commit to getting this work done for you in this iteration. And they commit as a team knowing what they know that day. Once they commit, the, the customer or product owner at that point is not allowed to come in and make changes. They can make changes to the backlog to prepare it for the next iteration. But this is the way that we, uh, in Agile, accept change and embrace it as we go through the project and yet lock down these short iterations of working time that allow us to complete the work, focus, without interruption and, and be able to move forward without having to run through that, um, that, that churning um, or uh, endless scope creep. We can also create not a WBS, but a feature breakdown structure. And I'll show you what that looks like. Essentially, it is the release and iteration plans that are created by the team in their release and iteration planning meeting. For scope verification, well, we do that as well. That's feature acceptance by the product owner or customer at the end of each iteration before um, the team can get credit for completing its goal. Um, now, the PEMBOX supports this idea of, of constantly revising and defining our scope um, each iteration based on what we've learned in the previous iteration. We're building learning in. And the PMBOK calls this uh, constant planning um, rolling wave planning. And I've got a quote here from the PMBOK that I want to read you. Um, As the work is decomposed to lower levels of detail, the ability to plan, manage, and control the work is enhanced. However, Excessive decomposition can lead to non-productive management efforts, inefficient use of resources, and decreased uh, efficiency in performing the work. So that's why we don't do this detailed, big, upfront design and planning at the beginning of the project. Instead, in Agile, we are breaking that detailed planning down to having it be just in time right as we begin to do the work. Um, so Agile simply says that because things change so often, you really shouldn't spend the time doing this excessive decomposition, as the PMBOK calls it, uh, and, until you're ready to begin the iteration, until you're ready to do the work. So here's a picture of a team, a co-located Agile team, doing their iteration planning. Um, you can see that they're all swarming around the board, grouping together, and trying to determine um, what are the tasks that they need to do, and who's going to do them, how long is it going to take, working out dependencies. The team is able to do this um, without being directed by a, the project manager. The project manager is there simply to facilitate the process. And I mentioned before that instead of creating um, a work breakdown structure, we, we call it a feature breakdown structure. So a result of the team doing their iteration planning um, is, and their release planning is that you have, for each iteration, the features that you'll be working on for each for your release planning. And then for your iteration planning, you'll have, for each of those features, maybe smaller features, or, or um, for example, if, if this was, um, if you were writing user stories, 
this might be considered an epic, which is then broken down into smaller stories or, or items of work that can be completed within that iteration. And then for each of these smaller features or stories, we'll cast those out, estimate them, and, and sign up for them. So your feature breakdown structure can be at either level depending on how you're using it. You can continue to use Gantt charts. Um, I don't recommend it, but if you need to, I mean, you can certainly do it. We just we usually don't show the tasks. Um, the duration is the full length of the iteration because the team has that time and uh, all of it available to complete uh, and the delivery of each of these features. And because the entire team is responsible, um, we typically don't do resource allocation because the team is committing to the delivery as a team, not I'm committing to my task. They're committing to the delivery of the feature. And in, when we talk about feature acceptance, well, we have acceptance criteria that we collect during the planning meeting. We can put this into uh, our virtual tool, or if we're co-located and we're using Post-its or three by five cards, we can record it here. Uh, but passing test cases aren't enough in Agile to indicate acceptance, only that we have a, a stable and potentially shippable uh, product increment. What we need to um, for our scope verification is the feature acceptance uh, by the product owner who has to accept each story or feature. And the way that we'll, we'll track and, and see how we're doing in the iteration is through the use of a burn down chart. And we'll track time at the bottom. So for our iterations, these would be the days in the iteration. And this would be the number of, of hours of the tasks that have been estimated. And on the first day of the iteration, we'll, we'll see that we have committed to you know, perhaps around 270 hours worth of work. And as the iteration progresses, we want to track what is left to do so that we can make sure that we are trending downwards and that we will finish on time as per our commitment. And you can do these burn down charts not only at the iteration level, but also at the release level. Now, these could be the number of iterations that make up your release or your project. And, and this could also be the hours or the points or however you're choosing to track your growth level estimates of your features. So you can see how you're progressing through your project as a whole. So for quality management, um, we take our quality planning, and a lot of it is defined simply by the framework of the agile approach that you're using. Well, one of the things we do make sure that we include is our definition of done. It, it's no longer enough to have these percent completes on tasks. We have acceptance criteria for each of the features, but we also need to have a definition of done for the iteration itself. So we get rid of this idea of being 90% you know, complete for days and days or weeks and weeks. And instead, you're either done or you're not. It's a, a simple bit switch. You either are or are not done. So when we do our reporting to management, it's much clearer where we truly are in the project and, and how much we've been able to deliver. For our quality assurance, this is the nice part. QA is now involved from the beginning because we have cross-functional teams in Agile. It's no longer a group of separate teams siloed by their skill set. You have Agile teams that are um, cross-functional in that they include developers, uh, testers, uh, tech writers, DBAs, whoever is needed to prepare a potentially shippable increment of code. And so QA, instead of um, being left to the end, uh, is now involved from the beginning. And at the end of each iteration, we continue to build quality in by our, through the use of our reviews 
and our retrospectives. We take the learning that we have achieved in that iteration, and we make decisions based on those learnings and implement them immediately in the next iteration to make continuous improvement just a part of the Agile framework. And in terms of quality control, with quality assurance being about building quality in, and quality control being about the testing, well, with Agile, we test early and often. It's our goal to have each potentially shippable increment of code that's delivered at the end of each iteration um, to be fully tested. We're not just writing the code and waiting for a later date to test. We're testing what we've written every single iteration. And we're also getting those features accepted by the product owner or customer. So here's one example of our definition of done. Um, for this team, it's working software, meaning that the software has been coded and tested. Um, but also, it's been signed off by the product owner, so it's coded, tested, and accepted by the product owner, that they have a certain amount of documentation for their proof of process, that they've taken this increment of code and migrated it into production, and that they have a set of passing test results that they can use as well as part of their proof of process and to pass audits. Um, and here's an example of, again, building quality in. These are a couple of programmers. The whole idea around um, extreme programming is that if these practices are good, we should do them all the time. And so here's a photo of two programmers who are doing peer reviews as they code. And in an XP, this is called paired programming, so that you have two sets of eyes on the code as it's being created and as it's being integrated in with a whole. And then here is an example of quality assurance in action as well. The, the demo, the review, and the retrospective agendas have the team checking their metrics, um, doing analysis on those metrics, um, making, and then making recommendations for change uh, based on what they've learned in that iteration, and taking those recommendations and turning them into actionable items that in the next iteration will be revisited to see of these recommendations and decisions that we made and implemented, how did they work for us? So this is a continuous, ongoing improvement process. So I'm thinking that we probably won't have time for risk management, so I am going to skip it. But it will be in the deck if, if you'd like to get a copy of that. And you can get a copy of the deck by either emailing me or the folks at version 1. So I will say that um, the Agile framework does address core risks, whether it's the um, intrinsic schedule flaw, specification breakdown, scope creep, personnel loss or productivity variation. And, and these core risks were created by Tom DeMarco and Tim Lister, authors of Waltzing with Bears. Um, and if you just, uh, in your own time, take a look at how the framework addresses each of these risks, you'll see that Agile itself is perfect for your high-risk project because of its uh, great attention to um, inspecting and adapting um, as you go along. So let's take a look at what we've talked about. Project planning is broken out into multiple levels of planning. Uh, we looked at some release planning, iteration planning. And while we didn't look at daily planning, at, at the beginning of every day, the team will say, this is what uh, I plan to do today. Um, this is what I did yesterday. And, and, and here's what's getting in my way. And the Agile project manager is listening, listening carefully for those things that are getting in their way and working to mitigate those, those things and, and do what they can to address those outstanding issues. So as an Agile project manager, you're facilitating and coaching a team in order to help them make the best decisions. And, and that then frees you 
to focus on strategic and organizational issues. And we'll look a little bit more at what your role is as we finish this review. So scope is defined at a granularity that is appropriate for the time horizon. The closer you are to doing the work, the more detailed you will be. Um, and scope is verified by the acceptance of each feature by the product owner. Your work breakdown structures become feature breakdown structures. And instead of using Gantt charts, we use burn down charts. Test-driven development, the idea of creating tests first and then writing the code to pass those tests. Uh, and cross-functional teams help to bring quality assurance and planning activities all the way up to the front, to the beginning of the project. And these continue throughout the project. If there are any defects that are found within an iteration, they are fixed there within the iteration. And those features are then accepted by the product owner or the customer. Um, and then highly visible information radiators and constant feedback cycles help teams to identify and monitor potential risks, and as well as the nature of the Agile framework it, itself, so that you can see risks as they appear and respond effectively uh, throughout the project. So let's look at your new role as a servant leader. Um, then we'll look at uh, some places you can find additional information. And then we'll have some time for your questions. So your responsibilities as an Agile project manager, number one, is to safeguard the process. So you have to facilitate these meetings and help the team learn what it is to make decisions collaboratively help them to reach consensus. And you have to do this without making the decision for them. Um, that involves a lot of training around good facilitation techniques. So there's some books at the end that I'm going to recommend to you. And one of them uh, is with, with regard to learning how to be a better facilitator. You're also going to pay attention to the roadblocks that the team comes up through and uh, I'm sorry, comes up with, and you're going to work through those, um, sometimes with the help of the team, sometimes on your own, while the team continues to do the work that it committed to doing to achieve the goal that was set out for that iteration. And you're also going to want to protect the team from distractions. So um, that is often a, a large chunk of your job, particularly in traditional organizations where people are often time sliced. And they're not just working on your project, they're working on several others. So working with others to help determine um, what, what can be put off to allow the team to focus on what they've committed to and how to reduce that time slicing, again, is one of the key things that you'll do as an Agile project manager. So in doing that, you're going to really be focusing on two things. You're going to be mediating. And when you're team facing, you're mediating the team disputes, dysfunctions, and helping them learn how to achieve consensus through your facilitation efforts. Once the team becomes really, truly self-organizing and is able to reach consensus and make decisions on their own about how to deliver on their goals and commitments, you can begin to turn outside the team and begin the negotiations with regard to organizational issues like time slicing and how to get your team fully committed to your project, how to um, address other issues that the team will come up with that are outside their sphere of influence, that you'll have to work with others and other divisions and other managers to try to address. You'll also want to focus on building your community, particularly a safe environment that fosters this sort of collaborative decision making and encourages experimentation and, and allows teams to, to fail and learn from that failing and build that learning into the next iteration so that they continue to become better and better at delivering on their promises. You're also going to be, as I like to say, 
you're an agent of organizational change. And, and that really becomes your primary role. Once your team is up and operating at a, a high degree of efficiency um, in an agile process, then you will turn your focus to being that agent of organizational change in your company. And you'll do this by sharing your experiences with others and by being a liaison, an ambassador, and an advocate across your organization. And here's some of the things you do not do. You do not own the product backlog. That belongs to the business representative, whether that's the product owner, uh, the customer, the end user. It's that individual who is uh, being the voice of the customer and making decisions about the product. You also do not own the estimates. The delivery team owns them. Um, you are facilitating them doing the planning to come up with the estimates. And you don't make the delivery decisions. Okay? Instead, you're going to be focusing, again, on that strategic uh, change in organizational issue resolution. Um, and remember, you don't have to have all of the answers. It, when in doubt, ask the team. They're the ones that are in the trenches every day. They're, they're the ones that are doing the work. They're the ones who will surprise you with the incredible innovation um, and possibilities that they're able to come up with to solve problems. So here's where you can find some more information. Um, you still have time to register for the uh, Agile Palooza in San Francisco if you're there. That's a one-day event. It's incredibly cheap. It's, I think it's like $60, $65, $69. Um, and it's uh, a full day for both Agile novices and folks that are more experienced. They have two tracks. There's the Better Software Conference coming up in Las Vegas, and there's the Agile 2009 Conference coming up in Chicago. So there are links so that you can learn more about each of these different conferences. And if you're interested in training, um, along with some colleagues of mine, we're going to be doing a three-day certified Scrum Master class in July in Boston, specifically targeted to professional project managers. Uh, while we haven't listed it yet on the Scrum Alliance site, it should be up within the next uh, couple of weeks, so watch for it there. Um, and eventually, it'll make it to my website as well. You've got some free online resources, the Agile Alliance, the Agile Project Leadership Network, and the Scrum Alliance. You should check all of those out to see if there are chapters in your city that you can join and go to to learn more about Agile from those who are practicing it or who are like you learning about it for the first time. Uh, I've got some resources on my website. Uh, my website is sort of in the midst of a transition right now. so. Um, uh, hopefully, um, you'll be able to access it with no trouble. But if you do have trouble, just come back in a day or two. I'm uh, transitioning from uh, one, one site to another. Um, and then, of course, if you would like to participate or just be a lurker, there's some discussion groups here. The PMI Agile one, which I've mentioned before. We've got the Scrum Development Group, if you are focusing on Scrum. Or if you are looking just for something more generic but that's focused on project management, we have an Agile project management discussion group as well. They're all very active. More resources. A lot of you have to worry about whether or not, um, if you're uh, uh, trying to be assessed at CMMI uh, level three, then you can read an experience report uh, by David Anderson here. Um, and then these are some of the books. One of the ones I was mentioning is that if you are going to uh, uh, embrace the idea of being a good facilitator for your Agile team, then this is the book you're going to want to get, Collaboration Explained by Gene Tobeka. Um, if you're looking for the more information on practices around Agile, Agile Estimating and Planning and User Stories Applied by Mike Cohn are wonderful. I can't remember, recommend them highly enough. Uh, Behind Closed Doors is a great book on, uh, from a manager's perspective on how to work with um, self-organizing teams. Scaling Software Agility is how Agile scales to large teams. And you've got books on Scrum, on Lean, Lean Thinking, which has nothing to do with software, but which is a wonderful book to get your executives thinking about what it means to be Agile. And of course, if you're looking for a more extensive mapping of 
uh, PEMBOK practices to Agile practices, then you may want to pick up the book that Stacia Broderick and I wrote. So um, I'll turn it back over to you, Leanne. You can uh, start peppering me with questions. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. The presentation was excellent. Um, first question that we have is, what about project initiation in Agile? In PEMBOK, we have project preliminary scope statement with background, context, high level, uh, et cetera. What is the, how is that implemented in Agile? Well, it's, you know, it's very similar. We, um, at least in the, the teams that I've worked with, we still have a, a, a kickoff meeting. What's different is that we invite the entire team. So it's not just a group of managers having a kickoff and talking about you know, who's going to do what. We'll bring the entire team along with a one-page project charter that we have prepared ahead of time with the help of uh, the product owner, and uh, maybe a, an architect or a, a lead from the development team. So we'll have that straw man. The product owner will present the vision to the team. And then the team will do some exercises to ensure that they truly understand that vision. So again, as the project initiation phase isn't that dissimilar. The, the, the tricky part that you have to worry about, really, um, is if you can't bring the entire Agile team to the kickoff because you are still waiting to get charge codes. And so sometimes we've had that problem where it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. You, you want to get the team started, but you can't get the team started until you get the charge codes. But you can't get the charge codes until you do some sort of design spec. That, uh, it, it's almost like it takes you back into waterfall. So you have to begin being that agent of organizational change, often straight out of the gate, to discuss in our project initiation what are the things that we, we absolutely have to have and what are the things that we can build as, as we go as part of rolling wave planning that is considered perfectly acceptable by the PMBOK. So there's no clear black and white answer to that other than you know just plan to experiment and uh, and plan with detail that's appropriate to your horizon. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, can Agile be put, uh, used for fixed price projects? And if so, how do you manage scope? Oh, you know, that, that's a great question. And I'm trying to think of where the best place is to send people for that. There, you know what, if, if you've got some questions with regard to Agile contracting, I've got a, a set of links to what other people have written about it. So you can email me and I'll send you that. Um, if you don't want to do that, what you can do is simply Google on Jeff Sutherland and Money for Nothing. He created a wonderful presentation on how to do fixed price contracting and be agile. So the short answer is yes, you can certainly do it. And the long answer will shoot. That would probably be another one hour um, webinar right there, but Jeff Sutherland has already done it, and he's done it very well, and I don't think I could improve on it. So I just direct people to his work. Excellent. Um, what is the best way to integrate, integrate QA into an organization that hasn't had any level of formal testing in the past? Wow, that's a hard one. Um, if we assume that by QA you're not talking about quality assurance in the sense that you know the uh, they're often called the process police, but instead, when you say QA, you mean really just a, a testers. If you haven't had formal testing in the past, you know don't don't worry about it. What we want to do is improve technical practices. We're not focused really on the formality of whether or not you know you're officially a tester. You've got a lot of really great XP teams out there where the development team doesn't make that distinction between I am a UI programmer and, and I am a Java coder and I am a tester. They all just contribute and do whatever is needed. So they'll sit down and they, they all write unit tests. They all help working uh, together using uh, tools like uh, FIT and Fitness to create uh, functional testing. So it's really the responsibility of the team to ensure that quality is built in as they go through each iteration. 
And that's the best thing. That's the best way I can answer that. I think you you probably need some. If you've never done anything except manual testing before, you'll probably need to have someone come in and and help you with with some training on some of the automated tools that are out there, um, and not just in terms of of automated testing, but also configuration management. Because if you can't get a daily build, and if you don't have the right environment to do your branching and to have different environments for tests and for development, then you're going to have another whole slew of problems. So you'll, you'll want to just uh, look to bring someone in to help you with that. Thank you. One last question before we wrap up. Um, what is your experience with teams in a combination of remote locations, including overseas? Ooh, well, again, there's been a lot written about um, distributed agile, and I've been part of teams that have had, um, let's see, they were located throughout the U.S. as well as Pune, and then another team that I was part of, um, most of them were based in Los Angeles. Well, not most, I'd say half were in Los Angeles and the other half were in London. So what it does is it just simply reduces, um, it reduces the speed with which communication takes place, and that's sort of stating the obvious. But if you look at the amount of time that the one team that was half here and half in London spent on uh, doing an iteration planning meeting, it only took them about three hours to do an iteration planning meeting for a two-week iteration. But that three hours was stretched out over two and a half days. Because of the time differences, it would be you know, first thing in the morning for the folks in LA, but it'd be near the end of that day for the folks in London. So they'd spend an hour talking about, you know, the, the detail around the features. And once the product owner had finished and they'd, they peppered him with questions, then the guys in London would hang up and go to the pub and they'd come back the next day and then start tasking things out and then share that information at the end of their second day with the folks in LA who'd come in for the beginning of their second day. And, and as a result of this, you know, um, this need to account for the, the different time zones that they were working in, it, that iteration planning meeting took, you know, two to two and a half days, but it was really only three hours of effort. So you have to deal with stuff like that. Um, there are lots and lots of experience reports and articles that have been written on distributed agile. Um, you, again, you can certainly go out there and, and Google it. Or you know, if you're feeling lazy, send me an email, and I'll send you links to some of the things that I've collected in the past. Thank you so much for your time, Michelle. Um, we really appreciate it. I think we're, it was a great presentation with some really great questions that were uh, asked and answered. Thank everyone for attending.